we're all going to die at some point. But as much as possible, according to, you know, our desire, our faith, our trust, and our, our, uh, our uh, really, it gets down to our, our appetite to live, our desire to, to continue to grow and see the things of God. Mm -hmm. And so the Lord works within our cooperation in that area. Amen. God would have us, we're going to live forever. The Lord have us live on earth as long as we desire, but we realize because, you know, the body's touched with sin. So, it, you know, the outward man is going to perish, Amen. but you might as well uh, live as long as you can. Just like Paul said, till I finish my course. Right. Amen. You have a course. God gives you a course, just like one of these young brothers right here. One gentleman uh, that Josh knows died. And he was how old was he? 20 what? 21? 20? Oh, he just turned 18. Well, let's retract what I said then. He just turned 18. And so uh, you know that the Lord didn't take him. I bet you someone at the funeral will go, well, the Lord needed him. Yeah, where's that at in the Bible, genius? The Lord didn't take him. We make choices and decisions. And then the devil conspires with our choices and decisions, doesn't he? And so thank God for the preserving life for so. Even you youngsters, you can hear these things right now so that you don't jeopardize, that you learn to calibrate. Listen, you learn to calibrate, right? How many of you understand this? This is for the, these gentlemen before we start recording. How many of you learn? You start an engine, your car, pistons start going. You, you don't know that, but I do. You could look on Google and I'll show you. Pistons start going. A crank starts spinning, right? It hits the pistons. Then there's a flywheel that goes to a drive shaft that turns the yoke that's in the third member, which has uh, axles that then turns the wheels. So there's precision, isn't there? There's precision. A little feedback, because otherwise we may stay here all night. If you don't help me, I'm ready to get out of here. But precision. So my point is, if you will live precisely, accurately, come on, you can live long, you can thrive, you can reach goals, right? You can apprehend, number one, first off, the most important thing is, you know, an intimate, deep relationship with the Lord. And as this gentleman that was speaking here Sunday said, I know it, but he put it in a good word. Intimate, intimacy truly equals obedience. See, there's this whole move of intimate, intimate with God. Yeah, but you can't be intimate with God and not have obedience or be quick and sharp and smart and alert. You can't be intimate with God and then be dull. I don't know what kind of God you serve in then because if you're intimate with him, fellowshipping him, knowing him, you become more like him. And Jesus is the wisest person that ever hit the face of this planet. I'm telling you. Come on now, I'm going to throw this last nugget. I had a little response. And that's what did. yep i'll speak over in this section so the reality is is listen jesus said wise as a serpent wise i mean jesus could have said wise as a camel wise as a lion wise as a goat wise as a bear he, could have said, he chose the serpent because the serpent had there's some wisdom that's why even the proverb says Go to the, thank you, brother. See, I'm just, I'm being quiet because I want you to hear that because it ain't hit you yet. Go to the ant. See, if you're in God's realm, oh man, I'm trying to get to the Easter message. I'm not trying to preach. It was going to have a nice little traditional. Go to the ant. If God tells you, go to the ant friend don't sit there and go that's a little ant go to the ant why the ant is smarter than three quarters of humanity you don't think so because you see the size of it that ant itself can lift more weight than a human being google it go to the ant so if you're stupid and you're lacking wisdom and you don't want to go to god he said then go to the ant that's for the unbeliever <laughs> Amen. Because James said, any man lacks wisdom, what? Ask who? Ask the Father. So that's for the believer. 
but for the one that's confused, disillusioned, and disoriented and doesn't understand divine laws and, and divine order and structure and how the earth was created and all these things, they got to go to the ant. <laughs> and God don't mind an ant talking to you because <laughs> he had a donkey talk to somebody. See, now I'm just saying, I'm going to get to the message. When you're flowing with the Holy Ghost, that's, this is what happens. You start sharing things like this and you didn't plan to. It's not in my notes. I got a nice little message for you. But there's a reason. Go to the ant for the unbeliever. And if you really study an ant, right? That's like an anthropologist. No. You study the ant, you would find out, sir, if the ant has like four times its strength. Did you know that? It's really true. Imagine me with four times my strength. I'm just saying. Other the day I bench press 205, so that means two, four, six, eight. That means I'm lifting 820 pounds. That'd be nice to lift 820 pounds. Yeah. 820 pounds would be nice to lift. That probably means I can curl like 200 on one arm. Mm -hmm. With that kind of strength, I could just be in the NFL, even at 51. <laughs> All right, praise the Lord. I think I don't want to continue. I don't want. I want to use our time wisely. Amen. Let's see if I got a verse for you to go to right, right out of the gate. Go to John 8. John, I'm just going to give you my small little introduction. Thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit. We know he's here. And uh, Lord, thank you for helping my tongue be that pen of a ready writer, etching with the help of the Holy Spirit, Lord, upon the hearts of the hearers, Lord, that the the word is sown into good soil and we'll receive a third. You'll receive a 30, 60, some a hundredfold, Lord. And it'll bring honor unto you and that fruit will remain. And so we thank you this evening, Lord, for what you you started to do and what you're going to continue to do. Amen. So John 8, you can just go to John 8 and 34. And I just want to read you a small introduction that I wrote down. I had some thoughts so we don't. Um, I was thinking about as we gathered together this evening uh and we recognize good friday but i just thought about it. we call it good friday don't we but to most people they think it's like bad they think you know um this is something horrific and this is something terrible this is something tragic pat you can just go around here sit up here bro yeah so they think it's tragic is it from and i just want you to think about this from a natural perspective, it's horrific, isn't it? And I'm just going to show you scripturally. And this is where we need to, to be on Good Friday. We don't need to leave here sombering, but we need to leave with value, honor, and, and uh, uh, a greater appreciation. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to say something real quickly because um, Santi over here, uh, me and Caleb were out last week hitting baseballs and Santi called him and he said, I said, well, what did Santi say? And as some gentle, young gentleman at 18 years old died, Santi said some, bro, that's something really great. Wow, things, certain things aren't worth it or something. See, when somebody passes away, you have a greater appreciation for life. You realize, wow, they're gone. I won't be able to interact with them no more. And that's a great mystery, isn't it? So what you and I have to do is we have to learn to value the things we have presently so that when they do slip away, you're not left void and missing, having a sense of loss. Okay. So to the world and to a lot of people, even Mother Mary, to some degree, some degree. You know why I say some? Because she understood who Jesus was. She, but yet she had to deal with that natural motherly instinct, right? And so she had to deal with her uh, emotions and all these things. So when we think about Good Friday, many people think, naturally speaking, that it's something tragic. But really, it's an oxymoron because... It's an oxymoron because an innocent man was murdered and crucified on the cross. And I do say murdered. But the father, the father God himself and Jesus 
to them, it was a great time of victory and joy. Do you know that? Victory and joy. There was a fulfillment of thousands of years coming and winding down to one moment. And see, the amazing thing, even Jesus, it says, who for the joy set before him. Joy. And even Jesus, I mean, let's just tell it this way. You know, you walk in places in San Francisco, we've all encountered it, and people are smoking. They're like, Phew. And you walk through and then there's an aroma left all over the place. The aroma of what they call medical, medical marijuana. But we know it wasn't medicine, was it? They were just getting high. But there's an aroma that's left. See, Jesus said about the woman that broke the alabaster, this fragrance was prepared for my burial. So think about what Jesus had, that fragrance on him. That love, and it's true, that love that that lady poured out on Jesus was still a fragrance while he was on the cross. And it brought him joy and the joy of knowing out of all those people, there was one person that loved him correctly. I'm telling you the truth. Because, you know, the story when he came into Simon's house, he said to Simon, look, baby, you didn't wash. You didn't wash my dirty old feet. You didn't put no oil on my head. But this woman hit her knees. She flat out washed my feet with her hair and the tears of her eyes. She broke out this perfume, anointed me, and did all this, prepared me for my bear. So that whole value of that carried him through the Garden of Gethsemane, carried him through the adversity, the, the, all the horrific things he went through. Amen. And, if, and Jesus is amazing. Jesus has a myopic view. Don't be fooled about Jesus. He will focus in on one aspect. Jesus sat over near the money changers when the lady threw in the two mites and he was like, she threw him more than you all. The, the, the poor lady. He noticed the amount she threw in and the heart with which she did it. Jesus, when the 10 lepers and one came back, Jesus didn't even focus on him and say, thanks, Pat, for coming. Just like me tonight. Thank you all for coming. Where's the others? That's Jesus. See, someone say, be grateful for the ones here. Jesus wasn't concerned about the ones there. They were going to get, they were going to get a message. He was concerned about the ones that weren't there. He said, weren't there nine others? See, they only got a half a healing. So when we talk about, we talk about Good Friday, we're talking about this. Many people today, if you were to look in all through hum humanity and all through the world, there's a, a lack of love in people's hearts, but they don't equate it as that. So they're searching, they're pursuing it in group affiliation, uh, certain organizations, certain gangs, certain institutes of education that validate you, certain prestigious clubs, certain kind of clothes that makes you feel like you're a part of. They're all, everybody's looking for something, aren't they? And, and there's very few people that would say, oh, I'm not looking for anything. No, no, no. If I investigate you, if I was... Thought, and I surged right down and I was able to pull up through an x-ray the intentions and the way you feel and the way you see yourself and all these things we'd see a different story because every person's looking for some sort of love why'd you get married why do you have a girlfriend don't tell me it's just sex come on man I don't believe that I don't believe that there's other reasons everybody's searching to connect with something that they feel an assurance with don't they? And so the reality is this is the greatest expression of God's love to humanity ever is witnessed and it's known and manifested on Good Friday. There is no greater expression of love. There's no greater expression of love except Good Friday, the crucifixion. See, the crucifixion takes care of everything when you have revelation, when you see it correctly and accurately, just like the ant. You could tell most people go to the ant, they go, you clown, what's wrong with you? Why would I go to an ant? That's stupid. What can I gain looking at an ant? I can just go to a higher institution of education, get a, a PhD. Why would I look at an ant? Well, see, that's, that's the same thing that Jesus said. That's the same thing that God said in 1 Corinthians. You know that? He said, let him who thinks he's wise become a fool. Because here's the reality. Society thinks the crucifixion is stupid. Do you know that most brilliant people think the crucifixion is foolishness? Why would God 
whew, why would God need to die on a cross? Why? That's foolishness. Why couldn't he just like wave his hand and everybody's changed? Everybody's cleansed. They, they, because they don't have the mind or, or the illuminated perspective that God has. God is a genius. Come on. There's nobody in the world. I'm, I'm just telling you, I don't care who they are. And I'm not mad at people. I like people. I don't care who they are. Albert Einstein. I don't care your greatest inventors. They're fools before God. And God would tell them that. If they thought they were something more than what they were, because everything that man has was given by God. You, you can look at all kinds of athletes that think they got all that talent. You know, they'll die and stand before God someday. And then the Lord will say, I gave you that talent. I entrusted you with that gift. I gave you that musical gift to glorify me, but you used it to glorify your flesh and to make millions of dollars that you never utilized to give into the kingdom. Every man will be judged for the gifts they've given them. Look at the talents, one talent, five, ta three talents, and five talents. And then Jesus called them to accountability. One guy took it and used it for the self-life, hit it. So the crucifix, and I want to say that is the greatest expression of the Father God's love. Romans 5 says, God proves, displays his love. See, a lot of people are looking for love, for money, from success, from a degree from another person but if they'll receive the power of this cross this power would inundate your heart illuminate your heart then you would live victorious and successful but you'd never ever get your eyes on anything else your bank account your degrees how great an athlete you are you would always keep him high and lifted up you would never look at anything else right that's what the apostle Paul said. I'm, I've been rich and I've been abased. But I, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Meaning I'm never moved by the highs and the lows. Never. My eyes will be on Jesus. Whether you put a dollar in my pocket or a million in my pocket. My eyes will look upon the Lord and upon that cross. And you can go back to that cross every day and get a fresh revelation and be inundated be filled with that revelation of the power of that thing and that's what it teaches and today we have multiple great coaching messages good coaching messages but see the reality is, is there's all kind of people coached all kind of people taught but they still ain't walking in no power because they can't even overcome a little simple snare of some form of sin some iniquity some guilt some shame some devious uh, behavior some uh, uh, oppression of the mind the only way out is the power of the shed blood on the cross and to enter into that next speed just like captain kirk said enter warp speed amen warp move into that realm and it's hard for people to understand because sometimes people get a little success at this level but then God's saying, I want to take you to that next level, and they can't. They can't break out into that next realm because to get, get through the next realm, you have to cross the threshold of the supernatural. You have to go, like Kirk said, where no man has gone before, so to speak. You have to go, and you can't get there in your own intellect, out of your own strength. You got to get in the faith ship. The faith ship takes you there. Amen. It's only in the faith mode that you can get into the warp speed. How many of you understand what I'm saying? Praise the Lord. So man now, the greatest, everybody say the greatest expression. The proof, man. You don't need no proof. You believe and receive it. And once you receive it and it hits your heart, Second Peter says that day star from on high dawns. When that thing dawns, you go, mm. that's the truth. I was talking to this guy the other day. I'm not going to tell you. He's a friend of mine and and he was, and I was telling him, I said, you know, and we're just having a talk because I know he, he puffs a little, you know, and I said, hey, do you think that that factory weed they're making now is stronger than the stuff they made up in the mountains with the regular sunlight, you know, and that's a legit question. And he said, oh, man, that stuff they're making today. And I said, I know, because I, I had a job. I, 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 I don't have a problem. I called my pastor and asked him, I said, man, uh, some guy just hired me. And when I showed up at the job, guess what it was? It was a factory where they grow plants. 
It was an electrical job. They're giving me four or 500 bucks a day. And I showed up to the job and there was, it was like they had lights being hooked up. They wanted lights. It was in a whole factory over in the East Bay, legit business. And I was like, uh, okay, well, I mean, I didn't feel bad about it. I'm there for the right reason. But the point, my, the point I'm trying to tell you is it's factory compared to stuff that was growing naturally. So my point is, is just like people that use that, they go, and as soon as that gets into their system, that THC goes doo, 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 twinkle, 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 all through their blood vessels. And next thing you know, they're like, mm-hmm, that's good stuff. That's the same way with the Holy Ghost and the word. I'm serious. When you get the revelation, see, see the reality is you have a lot of Christians walking around like this. Because it, it never dawned right here. See, it has to go from there to there. When you receive the revelation, not mental ascent, revelation hits your heart. You go, mm-hmm, kata. That's good stuff, Holy Ghost. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You always got to thank you. You always got an attitude of conquering. You ain't never sitting back going, no, I'm sorry for me. Those are people that ain't hit yet. Get my point? It ain't hit. It ain't dawn. That's what Peter said. When it dawns on your heart, see, it drops, goes through your ears, but sometimes it gets stuck right here. It's like a clogged drain. And it had, you know, you got to get the clock, the plunger out and wiki, 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 unclog that drain so it flows on down. Amen. Glory to God. Get the flow of the Holy Ghost, transform your life. Then you quit walking around just like, oh, I go to church. Oh, I get a church. Oh, I go to church. Hallelujah, brother. Huh? And then it's easy to sleep in on Sunday. Why? Because it ain't real to you. I'm just keeping it real with you. It ain't real. It ain't something that's hit you yet. It ain't life changing. Amen. It's not something that you want to do with your desire still. Amen. But if you begin to act on that truth enough, guess what? It's like lifting weights. There's progressive. You progress and then it becomes habit. Conditioning occurs. Amen. Conditioning and you like it. Because there's a benefit in there. There's a benefit. Amen. But man defaulted. He failed to abide. Now, I just want to read some of this. Man failed to abide in divine order. Uh, maybe let's call copies notes because I won't, I won't uh, break down every little word here. Man failed to abide in divine order. Not only disobeyed by going away from God, from dependence on God and God's instruction. But I, I want you to see this. But through one act, listen to me, one act. Now, all it takes is one act to change your life and the course and destiny of your future. One act, whether negative or positive, one act of obedience or one act of disobedience can alter years. You understand that? One act. I mean, if you, if you think about it, uh, I was talking to my friend Mark, and he told me, he goes, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine. And what he told me, he said, you know, where the brother crashed his motorcycle, he said, they change that fence all the time. One week, it'll be like this. Next week, it'll be like that. So he told me a lot of people go up there thinking, you know, and then. But the reality, you know, and I'll just say this. The reality is, is when you got the Holy Ghost, you have an internal GPS system that could tell you, you know. Don't go down that street today. Go that way. Even when I was in a motorcycle accident, I was telling this guy the other day, you know, the Lord told me wear a full face helmet. I was literally walking out of my garage, going to sell one of my motorcycles. I was walking out of my garage and I, and I looked over and I saw my, my black helmet there and I looked at it and I heard the Lord inside and a still small voice said, start to wear that. And then I interpreted that as, oh, I'll wear that on the freeway. But since I'm only going up to the bank on Irving, I'll just put that little half helmet on. And while I rode up, some guy pulled right out. I, there's nothing I can do. Just like I was telling the guy who lives upstairs to me. I go, you know, the only word was, oh, man. That's it. And I can remember flying in the air and I remember landing face first on the concrete. That was it. Knocked out. But later, I thought, if I had had that whole full face on, you know what would have happened? It had been like going head up with somebody in a game. That's all. I would have got up. I had no broken bone. I would have saved my teeth. My nose was cracked. A hospital trip, everything. 
just by listening with that that sonar inside that God's given every Christian. Every Christian, but you got to work it out. You got to develop it, don't you? Come on, man. That's the benefit of the cross. The cross ain't there to go, oh, my God, Jesus rose from the dead. There is a benefit for you. There's a benefit package that you got to open up and read. and be, mm, I'll take that benefit. Yep, thank you. Come on now. There's a benefit manual. You know, like when you go to work for a company, they go, here's the benefits of this company. You're like, mm, I'll take some of that stock. I'll take some of that and I'll take some of that. So he said right here, one act of lawlessness and offense opened the door to inequity, darkness. It's what you see in the world today. All this garbage going on. Politics, racism, COVID, sicknesses, uh, other nations now. All the natural disasters, all the things going on. It is all a byproduct of one man's act. Romans 5 tells you, Adam, open the door. Everything's screened in. Most people don't even know that. But simply, it's right there in the word of God. Every, bio, every dysfunction, malady, racism, hatred, every dysfunction, addiction, perversity, all the garbage you see going on in the earth, it's all byproduct of one man's act. He just yielded, opened it up, and humanity's paid the consequence. But the good news is the second Adam, amen, Jesus. And all you have to do is receive him by faith. He says he opened up that door to inequity and darkness, not only for generations. I want you to see this, though. But also it affected creation. Creation itself is groaning right now. Romans 8 tells you it's groaning, saying, where are the sons of men? I'll tell you this. Even in the middle of the COVID and all that, you know, all the animals started to come out. Animals started coming. Coyotes everywhere up in the streets, all through the city. They found a mountain lion down on Market Street. Why? People were gone. It's like that Will Smith movie. You know, yeah. what was the name of that Will Smith movie where he was the last one? Huh? I am or whatever. Yeah, I like. But, but the reality is, is creation itself says, hey, stand up and take your place, body of Christ. Because Adam, when God created Adam, Adam had authority over all the earth, friend waiting on no government you ain't waiting on science you ain't waiting on anything else you ain't waiting on nothing god says sons of god stand up that's what the resurrection and the crucifixion afforded to you but if you only see it as a guy dying on the cross and you don't look at it with the microscope of the heavenly father with the eyes of your understanding open then you'll never see that you'll just see jesus on a cross and in three days he rose and went look at my hands and don't doubt again bye-bye <laughs> right that's all you'll see Creation itself. Man exchanged the glory of God for the realm of death, destruction, corruption, depravity, degradation, and most of all, ready? A moment. Degeneration. What God created man to be began to walk backwards. And now these people will tell you, they tell you, oh, you came from a, a animal or a whatever. I don't know what the evolution. No, 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 no. See how backwards man got twisted, distorted, and, and warped in his own mind. You didn't come from no animal. I mean, how come animals haven't progressed today? Last time I checked, I don't see people drive. I don't see a lion driving down the street in a Cadillac. I don't see them driving a Hummer, a bird. I don't see it, right? I don't. De degeneration, man. Thank you. Digressed. Can you imagine that? Digressed away. I mean, if Jesus said all things are possible, oh, come on now. If he said that, see, we got to get from here. You're so conditioned up here. You're conditioned by institutions, by your parents, by society. You're conditioned. You're limited. Society tells you you're limited. There'll be, there's a few people that break out of that though. And they ain't even have faith, some of them. Some of them don't even have the faith. Now, oh, degeneration. And they fell away from that which is righteous, pure, peaceable, and all total loving. Loving. Amen? Amen. Now, I'll give you a couple of verses. Look at Mark. Mark 8, I mean, John 8, 
I'm going to just read these very quickly. And then I'll get to my couple points and we'll do what we got to do. I don't want to make it a long night. I'll probably skip half this. You can look at my notes. John chapter 8. Let me get there. In verse 34. Look at Man became a slave. That's what the scripture actually teaches. Man became a slave. Man's a slave today. To fear. To insecurity. To guilt. To shame. To weakness. To phobias. To death. Mainly. Man's a slave to death. You know, it's what, it's what Hebrews 2 says. Who their all lifetime through the fear of death were in bondage. Fear of death creates every, creates greed. Fear of death creates greed, right? When that fear of death is extracted out of your life, you don't have that covetous, idolatrous, greedy attitude. You become a distributor, a sharer. Why? Because fear tells you, what about you? What's going to happen? Fear tells you, you got to take care of yourself. That's what, that's what happened to Adam. Remember, he put the fig leaves over himself. Come on, Adam went, uh-oh, get the coverings out. Oh, man, I don't have time to preach here tonight. Because you know, the reality is man's still doing that. Let me cover this up. Man got all kind of ways right now, you know, all kind of stuff going on in the earth, especially around race now. And so man's going to try to cover it up, you know. So you watch a little bit of the news, so you'll see all. Now it'll be, you know, there's, there's all kinds of racial issues. And so government will try to cover it up. And, and this person will do that. None of that can be fixed. It's only fixed by the power of the shed blood on the cross. That's it. God said, let me get that offering and sacrifice out. And he came and said, let me cover you. You can't cover your own failures, your own faults, your own sicknesses, your own guilt, your sins, your own inequities. You can't cover them and just try to be a better person. Let me coach you into be a better person. No, I coach you into becoming a more sophisticated, arrogant, unhumble person. That's what happens when you get coached. When you get taught the word, you get liberated. See, Jesus tells you right here. See, coaching tells you you're not a sinner. You don't need God. Just study hard. Just be a good kid. Get a good job. Meet a good husband. Meet a good wife. You know? Just do all that and you'll be okay. On the earth, you will. What's going to happen when you die? Leave your body. You're going to stand up before God the Father and say, look, man, I was a good student. Uh, you know, I, I treated the elderly good. I didn't steal. I didn't rob. I didn't lie. I, I cussed like three times. Uh, you know, I wasn't angry. I wasn't a racist. Uh, you know, I was generous. I fed the poor. And God's going to say, that's all good and fine and dandy, young rich ruler. You get it? The young rich ruler. I did all those things. And Jesus said, I know you have. But go sell all you have. Give to the poor now. Follow me. And he went, I did everything already. And Jesus said, by the way, young brother, beware of covetousness. The deification of self and other created things rather than that focal on God. See that? The deifying lifting up. So John 8, 34 is what Jesus said right here. Jesus said, verily I say to you, he that practices sin is a slave, a servant of sin. Romans 6 says, know to whom you yield yourself to obey his servant you are, whether of, ob whether of uh, 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 obedience unto righteousness or defect, sin, uh, uh, corruption, unto inequity see the only thing that can stop everything right now that's going on all the motions that are going on still the degeneration the depravity right the degradation in society the only thing that can lift you out right is the life of jesus amen let me read this to you real quick since it popped into my spirit go to philippians i'm gonna hurry up i'm gonna cut this short the only thing that can lift you out Come on. Oh, boy. I got I, I want to get to it because we got we got stuff. And I don't want I said it was going to be short. I want to read you what Paul said, though, in Philippians three. I love this in the Amplified. Paul said, verse 10, I'm going to say my 
determined purpose. He said, I want to know him. I want to become more deeply, intimately acquainted with him. I need some believers today like Paul. Paul was stoned. Paul was whipped. Paul was beaten, punched. And Paul got back up and said, man, I got to go do, I got on a mission. You can't stop me. See, that, I'm serious. He was lost in the deep. He was beaten with rods. Christians today, man, I mean, you ever been beaten? Beaten with rods, whipped, flesh off his back coming off. Today, they don't even have a clue. This man got right back up, marched right back in. Me. That, I mean, you talk about real love. That's real love. I love those people enough to give my own life for it. How many people give their life today for someone else? Very few. The Bible says it in Romans 5. It says, scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Per venture, a good man, someone even dare to die. <laughs> per adventure, for a good for someone just try to dare. But God proves his love that while you were a sinner, a wretched, miserable, you know, lying, cheating, stealing <laughs> person. And, and we're all liars and cheaters and stealers and dishonest and, and jealous and envious and, and resentful in some capacity. Do you understand that? You just don't see it. I'll tell you, you don't see the things till they come out. You know, the prodigal son's brother was a loving brother until dad, came, until the, the, the loser came home. When the loser came home, spent all the money, used up all the resources. And then he came home and dad said, don't worry about it. Kill the fatted calf, get a good jacket for him, slap a ring on that finger, put some shoes back on him. Let's go party then. And the brother that was patiently waiting and loyal and serving and good and, and very proper said, what the? And lost his cool. And disrespected his own father. Why? Because he felt I've been loyal. So you don't even know what's in you until you are put with your back against a wall. And then you'll see, I can tell you, I've experienced it. You'll see things come out of you that are so ugly that you wouldn't even believe were there. And you then in your ugly inequity, look up and go, thank you for that redeeming blood. Amen. Now you wouldn't believe those things are in you. Because a lot of Christians aren't honest with themselves. But they're in there. Mm -hmm. And put in the right situation. You would betray. You would lie. You would cheat. In the right situation. If I drop you down in I, uh, Afghanistan today. And, I put a, and, and you and I were captured. And they said. You can live. Put a bullet in that pastor. There'd be very few people that would just say, no, it don't matter if you kill me. I will not defile. I will not allow you to manipulate, twist, and connive and move me in away from my consecration. I'm telling you, put in those situations. Let me hurry up here. I didn't get, I got to get there flipping. Man, see, you start... You have these notes to do a nice little sermonette. And then it says, Paul says, verse 11 in Amphi's chapter 3 says, If possible, I want to attain the spiritual and moral resurrection. Now, this is what I like. That lifts me out from among the dead, even while I'm in the body. That means right now that you can be walking around in a level of dominion authority and rule it's possible that's what paul says i want to attain that i want to i want that resurrection life to operate in me that lifts me out that means every time a temptation a trial and adversity a whiny complaining grumbling attitude tries to come upon you a sulkiness a feeling sorry for yourself a, an anger a murderous attitude a suicidal spirit that means that that life of jesus can just right then and there lift you right out of the chamber of inequity right there because of what's in you, because of the cross. That's power. You don't need to go to Dr. Phil. You don't need to check in with Oprah. You don't need to get a $150, $250 counseling session to fix your emotions because when you were a child, you didn't have a father or a mother in the home or your brother or sister beat you up. 
or your parents divorced or, or something bad happened to you. See, that life of God will lift you out from your experience and give you a new experience. And you won't walk around feeling empty and void and not understanding why you weren't loved. And I got to get my hair pink now. And I got to get 20 piercings on my face and whatever else you got to do to mutilate yourself, to make yourself feel like you're a part. The life of Jesus will lift you out of the den and the claws and the grip of sin, inequity, and self-hatred. And lift you out to where you were looking in the mirror and respect yourself now. I'm more capable today of doing more damage as a Christian than I ever was as an unbeliever. I am. I really am. I told Rita that the other day. I, I, I said, I'm more capable now. Someone says, how can that be? Because something happens when you move into the realm of the spirit. You become more awakened. Your Things are more real to you. But at the same time, there is an adversary that is perpetually launching arrows, seducing your emotions, trying to pull you into some form of offense, trying to damage you perpetually. He roams about looking. See, when you were not saved, you were already devoured. You were already devoured, devoured and unempowered. So Satan didn't toy with you. But once you became armed and put on the armor of light, you became a target now. You became an, an, an adversary to him. Somebody. So here you go. He says, it lifts you out. I'm not even going to go into the rest of this. You could look at Colossians 1. It says you, be, you actually became an enemy. And I've just thought about this word today. The cross brings you back. That's the word I don't want it. To becoming an ally with God, but not just an ally, uh -huh. a heir, a joint heir, a son of God accepted in the beloved, holy without blame before him, the righteousness of God. You, Adam left being an ally in union with God and became an enemy. That's what scripture says. He became an enemy. Doesn't mean God, God's the chief that says, love your enemies. He's the greatest expression. If I were to say to you today, who's your enemy? I want you to pray for him. I want you to give him a, some money out of your wallet. I want you to send him a thank you card for helping you to grow up and actually become spiritual. I want you to send him a thousand dollar check. I want you to send him a $2,000 check. Do you know I had an enemy one time or twice? I had a different time. And a friend of mine told me, said, brother, send him a thousand dollar check. Your enemy. And I struggled, and finally I was like, it happened a couple times. Not with a thousand, but, and I did, or gave somebody some. I gave my enemy one time, I gave an enemy a whole season worth of tickets. It was like five grand. Okay. Three seats. Here, have the whole season. And they went to the Super Bowl that year. <laughs> Imagine how I felt. When I had to buy my own ticket to go to a game that I had to get. <laughs> hmm. But I'll tell you this. Here's a good testimony. One but a couple years later, I was strolling down to the 49ers new stadium with four seats. My seats. Don't you tell me that it don't work right. And I had no money in my pocket. And the Lord said, go down to that new stadium. And get you some seats. I said, Lord, you know I ain't got no money. And the Lord said, aren't you a person of faith? I said, I sure am. I'm headed that way right now. Went down to where they were. I don't even tell the story. Because there was haters. There was, they were building the, the stadium. And there was nothing there. But a foundation. And I walked down. And I told the guy, yeah, I'm ready to get some seats. Let me take a look. I want to see where I want. Walked over to this area. Sat there. Mm, walked all the way around to the other side. Sat down there and then finally went back and I was like, yeah, I found where I want to sit. I'll be in contact. I can just tell you. I don't tell my business anymore. I can tell you that story. That 5,000 turned into, you know, whatever. So.
And the Lord did, and I didn't have any money. I was broke. You know, the Lord is able. Amen. Here it is. Man accured the debt with God that he was unable to pay. He came, became lost, controlled under Satan. He became dominated by the spirit of fear, the law of sin and death that ruled humanity. So Good Friday, I want you to go to Matthew real quick. A couple other verses, we'll close. Matthew, you got to see this. I want you to just see what Jesus said. Jesus lived by vision. Matthew 16, 21. Listen to what Jesus said. Good Friday, we are to remember this. It's more than just seeing him on the cross. It's a person who gave himself for your debt. If I just walked up to you right now and said, what kind of credit card debt you got? What kind of mortgage you got? You owe. What kind of debt on your car? And I just said, how much is that? Calculate it all up and boom, I pay it all for you right now. That's the debt you owed. Humanity owed a debt in a sense. Amen. So when we remember Matthew 16, verse 21, it says, from that time forward, Jesus showed the disciples how he must go to Jerusalem. Now listen to this. Suffer. Mm -hmm. Suffer many things. Suffer from elders, chief priests, scribes, be killed and rise again. Now go to Luke real quick. Luke 18. I want you to just see this. I mean, most people today don't even have no clue for suffering, more or less suffering for somebody else. You know, I can be honest. I was here with my mom working and I was setting up these flowers and I'm like, this is for women, man. And I was grumbling to myself and I'm like, man, we just, 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 this is not what, you know, year after year after year, you get wore out. And then when you see that other people were doing it and they've left their positions, how many, of you know, went AWOL. Reality is, man, stuff falls on you, man. Everything falls on you. And like, you're not really getting anything, so to speak. You know what I mean? So you start, your mind starts working. And while I was walking to the back, the Lord's like, that's a good place to go to Gethsemane, Dave. <laughs> not mine, but thine. Get it? Amen. Not mine, but thine. Ain't all about you. It's not all about how you feel, what you think, what you want. Well, I don't like this. Oh, save it. You know what I mean? It's not all about you, Dave. It's not all about you, sister. Uh -huh. And the Lord has to check you sometimes. And Jesus here was telling his future. Matt, Luke 18, verse 10. Look at, look at what Jesus says. I mean, excuse me, verse 31. And behold, we go up to Jerusalem. So all things of the prophets and the son of man shall be done. He's going to be delivered. He'll be mocked, spit on. Uh, he's going to be handled and treated disrespectfully. He, he's going to be beaten. He's going to be whipped. And he's going to be put to death. It's not even like, like this. Look, it's not even like this. Execute him. It wasn't even like that. He got worse than that. What Jesus got was not even just kill him. What Jesus got is let's mock him to he spit in his face, slap him, punch him, make fun of him, whip him, beat him down, make him carry his own cross that weighed who knows how much with a broken rib and a scarred up back. I mean, you know, the, the best thing that could have done is they made him suffer. You know, he went through all that. Way he kept saying, not mine but thine, not mine but thine. I'm gonna finish my course, I'm gonna get the job done. Amen. So, when you look at the cross and then you see the benefit of what Jesus gave, let me hear and finish this up. Yet, in the mind of God, I've got to read this. I, I gotta go here, I gotta go. Go to Ephesians real quick and first Corinthians. I gotta go there and then I'll, I'll read a couple others, then we'll close. There it is. I, I gotta show this. I gotta Ephesians 1. Because this is what it's all about. You need the telescope of Jesus to see the reality of what the crucifixion was. Ephesians 1 in the Amplified says, this is also, verse, uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 9, to enlighten men and make plain to them the plan of God so that the mystery kept hidden through the ages and concealed now in the mind of God. Most Christians look at the cross they just they think that's foolish even the gentiles they don't realize the cross was 
the greatest revelation that God ever pulled out. Do you understand? It was hidden. And I'm going to show you why in a sec. Most Christians read this and they go, oh, great, fine and dandy. Okay, have another chocolate milk. Great. They don't have revelation because they're stuck in their head. It hadn't gone to the heart yet. But when you get a revelation of this, it launches you into full emancipation so that you can do the will of God, experience the perfect, complete will of God, and you'll have nothing less. You'll have nothing less. I guarantee you, when this revelation hits you, you no longer accept mere church. You no longer accept a nice little point about, you know, uh, uh, some little Easter story. You no longer accept that because every time you hear that, you're disappointed. Like someone, as I was watching some sermon, I send them to Pastor Eric. I watch people on Facebook and I send it to him and I go, I'm bored. It's like I go to a steakhouse and you serve me a piece of pizza. And I expected a ribeye. And I'm thinking, you know, how did Jesus feel when, you know, and it's kind of like all these trendy words and where's the power, man? Show me some power. Show me how to get lifted out. That little sermonette ain't going to help nobody depressed. Stuck on drugs, mama crying over a casket, ain't gonna help put money in your pocket when you ain't been to college. Come on now, you're not equipped for this life, but I'll tell you, when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, things start moving. Come on, things start turning inside. Come on, it takes the foolish things of the world, makes them wise, lifts them out of the dunghill. Amen. So I don't need a little sermon about, I wonder how Jesus felt when he was betrayed. That's no good. The only reason that's good is to say Jesus was betrayed and felt lonely. Therefore, Pat, you never have a right to feel lonely again, Pat. Every time you feel lonely, I want you to think how lonely Jesus was. See, if that scenario don't translate into a practical appliance in your life today, that sermon was a waste. Crumple it up and throw it out because it is not personal victory. It's just a good little Easter story for you to shed a tear and then go home and come Monday, go back and default back into you living like you was. If you don't believe in prosperity, why you got a 401k then? If you don't believe in healing, why you go to the doctors? The cross appropriated in your life registers all those things. Freedom, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Now look over in 1 Corinthians. Here we go. And then I give you the three little things and we're closing. This is why I like this. Because the greatest mystery. Come on, people love mystery novels. I got a mystery novel right here, friend. I got a mystery for you right here, Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew. I got a mystery for you right here in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says this, verse 2. I resolve this man was a genius. This is the smartest minister that walked the face of planet Earth outside Jesus. He said, look, once again, go to the ant. Simplicity. Do you know the greatest thinkers are the most practical? Paul said, look what Paul said. Second Corinthians, first Corinthians 2, for I resolved. I like it. I, I could camp here. I resolved. That's it. It's done. I've come to this full persuasion. I'm fully convinced. Uh, put the stamp of approval on it. It's all good. He says, I fully resolve. I don't know anything, nor do I want to be acquainted with anything. To make it a display of knowledge. Nothing to be conscious of. To be conscious of nothing among you except Christ crucified. What, what do you mean? What about all these theological uh, steps? Uh, what about systematic theology? Dr. Divinity. Paul said, I don't know anything except Jesus crucified. When Paul sees the crucifixion now, he sees something different. People have a different view of the crucifixion. One man goes, son of God. Someone else goes, 
like three types of people. Those who watch what's happening, those are, who are wondering what's happening, those who are contemplating what's happening, and those that are making something happen. Amen. Some are watching, some are gazing, some are reflecting, and some are doing, 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 not hearing, doing. Write the vision so you can run with it. When Paul sees the cross, he sees the greatest expression of God's love. God, I need your love. He says, I can't give you any more love than I already showed you. Look at the cross. Just like Jesus said, God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes on him will not perish. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness to neutralize the effects of their disobedience and sin and the poison of those vipers. It's Paul says, look at the cross. There you will find who you are in life. Your identity, because in that cross, it wasn't about Jesus. There it is. Jump down to verse six. Yet when we're among fully grown Christians, we impart a different wisdom of a divine plan. It, in, it was previously hidden. It is indeed a wisdom of this present age and world. It's not of this world. It didn't come from this world, friend. So you can't check with your head. You can't check with some other natural man if you want this kind of power and anointing and wisdom to flow. It doesn't come from man. It's not of this present world, which leaders and rulers. You can't find it in Donald Trump or Joe Biden. You can't find it in Nancy Pelosi. You can't find it in Ted Cruz. You can't find it in any of those people. You find it in the realm of God. You can't find it at your doctor's office unless he's been stewing on this for a long time. You can't find it at the movie theater or at school. You can't even find it at some churches. This kind of wisdom, which didn't come from man. So it wasn't created by man. So it has a certain additive to it. It's like rocket fuel. That's what it is. That's, that's the truth. And you got to eat that every day. Because when you get hit by this, you go, mm -mm, that's good. I'm going back. See, if you ain't going back, that's why, like Brother Mark said, if you're not excited about what you're seeing here, you ain't seen Jesus lately. That's the truth. You ain't seen them from a distance, you might, but you ain't seen them up front. Here you go. That's just what it said. We're setting forth a hidden once. Hold on. Verse seven. It was hidden from human understanding and revealed. God devised it before the ages for your glorification to lift you up out. Real simple. Ephesians now, and then we're, we're going to move on. God made him to be sin who knew no sin. That's the cross. On the cross, you died. You died. You expired. There was a funeral that went on. That's why Christians struggle because what happens is they go to church, but they never live the crucified life. See, they're still living on earth, making their decisions, making their choices. It's my money. It's my car. It's my life. I'll do what I want with it. Uh, they, see, but you can't have that life. See, that's why Christianity is watered down now. Because when you come to Jesus in the old days, you give them your all in all. You don't come and just say, I'll go to church. I love a few songs, big screen, smoke machines, and skinny jeans. But I give myself, he becomes Lord and Savior. My money's yours. So when you tell a person who's gone all the way, brother, give 10%. They're like, brother, I can get 20. When you tell a person who hadn't come all the way, they're like, <laughs> they're struggling. He gave you all. What happens when you're lying in a hospital and you need to summon that kind of power? You're going to think about that five or ten bucks. The devil's going to come back and say, you know, you weren't a good tither. And now you're dealing with the guilt, the condemnation, the shame, and you don't have faith that reaches out, lifts you out of that moment right there. Lifts you out. Your faith can lay hold of your healing. Your faith can take hold of the strength that you need to continue in life. When the, the challenges come to everybody, Jesus said, the storms come and they beat, 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 beat upon every person's house. They beat. But the one that didn't build it on this revelation, their house fell. They're out of church today. They're backslidden. They fell back like a dog returns to his vomit. They go back to that. Amen. The devil can't break. What God has built, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. 
I don't, I know what happened to my church. It don't matter. I'm still preaching and standing and going forward, pressing toward the mark of the high calling, serving Jesus, still in love, still burning, baking and on fire. And it ain't stopping, going from glory to glory. You can't break what God starts. If you break, it's because your dependence was on yourself. But the crucified life will surge right through you. Just like this guy came today and he said, oh, my nephew's going to go to rehab. He said, he's already been to rehab like three times. You know what my first question was? Who's paying? Because rehab costs about 20 to 30. I said, don't send him to rehab. If you've been there two, three times already, it's a waste of money. Someone says, how can you say that? Sit down with me for an hour. I will give you in one moment of eternity what will transform your life and put you on the right course. At that point, it's going to be up to you. Come up here to say, hey, I need some help. Can you walk with me, brother? Walk with me, brother. Brother, pastor, whatever. Thank you. You can get put on the right road, but at that point, you better walk with the Holy Ghost, the Lord, your helper. Save yourself 20, 30 G's. Because going back to the same old place, if it didn't fix it the first time and the second time, it ain't going to probably fix it the third time. Look. Third time's a charm. Where's that at? Here it is, 2 Corinthians. Ephesians, we're closing. Here we go. Ephesians, we're closing. Chapter 2, I'm going to give you these three just principles. I won't even preach on them. I'll just tell you. I want you to think about them. What the, the cross afforded you, this beauty right here. Ephesians 2. And you have the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. You have the quickened and made alive. Mm -hmm. When I heard that word, and. And is a conjunction. And you. I heard the words in my spirit 20 years ago or whatever it was. And you're included. The cross makes you included. Amen. Amen. Ain't got nothing to do with your race. Black, Asian, Hispanic. Nicaraguans. Italians and a little bit of Iranian in there. Uh, we got a South African. We got Mexico. We got what else? We got all, all pure Irish back there. None of that matters. In Christ's blood, you're included. Amen. 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 Ephesians, here it is. Ooh, I said an hour. We're, we're an hour and a half, so we got started late. That's good. Good timing. Ephesians 2, here it is real quickly, right here, verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love, where would he loved us? Even when we are dead in sins, hath made us alive together, mm -hmm. together, you don't got to do it alone, together forever, he made you alive together, he raised you up together, then he seated you together. You've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, you're living today. You live by faith in the son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. It's that simple. See, and if that doesn't make you want to serve him, and, and I'll tell you, especially for our young people here, if you think there's anything going to love you more than that, you're deceived. See, these youngsters have a chance to hear this word here are testimonies as adults that have been through different things. Because when I was young, I didn't have what they just heard. Had I received what they heard, I might not have went through. And of course, there's always some genius to go. There's always some genius to go. Well, this is good. No, no, I'd rather be like them. They say, well, then you wouldn't be you and have that revelation. Revelation has no bearing on what you go through in life. Revelation comes by being hungry and thirsty. Amen. Amen. Revelation comes by asking. Timothy didn't have to go through all that stuff, and he had revelation. Mm -hmm. well, we don't know his whole story. My point is, is you and I are included. Amen. We're made alive with him. When Jesus raised, we were buried with him. See, that's the mystery, that when Christ died, you died. 
you get a second life now. Second chance, the new birth. Amen. You're raised up with him now. You're lifted up above all the controlling influences that are in the world. Titus says, we were sometimes hateful and hating one another. I got no hate in my heart. I don't. I got no hate in my heart for anybody. You can't hate as a Christian. Hatred is like murder. That's what the Bible teaches in 1 John. He that has hatred in his heart doesn't know where he's going, and he's as a murderer. He has no life abiding in him. See, the life of God doesn't mean you, you have to like everybody. You'll have enemies of faith. But the reality is the love of God overcomes. It never fails, fades out. Amen? Amen. The love of God will help usher you and continue to lift you, lift you. If you keep giving place to it. That's what we're going to do tonight. Amen? Amen? I want you to come, each and every person. We have that communion, Vivian, that I sent you. Come up here and grab this communion element. I'm going to have, after we have this, communion with the video pastor eric's going to come up and pray for this communion yep come get one of these yourself i want you to come it's a sign of you coming to jesus for his life don't eat it yet pastor eric's going to pray for it come get one yourself instead of me giving it to you you come jesus said as often as you do this that's right so just be patient let's watch this video and i want you to reflect on this message we ministered here this evening. This is an opportune time. Lay aside some weights, put off some failures, readjust your thinking. Readjust your thinking. Give yourself wholly to Jesus. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect, but he's going to work in you and help you become who he wants you to be. Who he wants you to be. And that's where you're going to be blessed. That's where you're going to thrive. That's where you're going to flourish. And you don't have to do it in your own strength. Amen. This message was brought to you by Living Water Fellowship San Francisco. You can connect with us on Facebook or email us at sflivingwater.com.